The Caribs of Dominica by Dovdas Tater Introduction as the last direct descendants of those first found American Redskins, the island Arawak and the conquering island Carib, the Caribs of Dominica possess an unique historical and sentimental interest. Today, in fact, they are the only indigenous Indians to be found in all the West Indian chain between the Guyanas and Florida. Owing, no doubt, to the rugged nature of their homeland, they have outlived their cousins of the other Caribbees, with the partial exception of St. Vincent, by some 200 years. But at last their course is run, and they are fast disappearing. Of their story little is known and less written, and it is with the purpose of recording, before it becomes too late. Something of this vestige of a once virile and powerful people, that my own attempt at knowing them has been made. Dominica was discovered on Columbus' second voyage, and was so named by him for its being first sighted on Sunday, November 3, 1493. In a letter dated 1494, Diego Chanca, the fleet's doctor, gives its native name as Care, though this may have been a confusion with the Arawak term for island or land in general Cara as in Turicara, for Guadeloupe, and Iwinicara for Martinique. However, the population was then of too warlike a nature, and the Caribbees of too little value in the Spaniards' eyes, to warrant any serious attempts at settlement. It is therefore not until well into the 17th century that we get any reliable reports this time from the French missionary fathers of the Carib Islanders. Father Raymond Breton spent nearly 25 years among the Caribs of Dominica, and wrote subsequently a Carib dictionary, a grammar, and a translation of the usual prayers, together with a catechism in their tongue. Under the various headings of the dictionary he gives a concise description of the local beliefs, customs, and arts, as well as of the flora and fauna of the island, domestic utensils, weapons, etc. While he deplores what he naturally considers the Caribs' moral laxity in certain respects, drink, women, and especially their insensibility or indifference to the call of religion, he succeeded, he himself tells us, during his 25 years of zeal, in converting only Quelks on Fawn. Sir Ellie Point de la Mort, he shows a general liking for his hosts, calls them his friends, and says that theft and lying were unknown to them before the advent of the Christian Europeans a statement confirmed by La Board, Roquefort, and Labat. Roquefort further says that while the Caribs of St. Vincent and Dominica were slave owners they never evinced the same cruelty as was common among the whites, but treated their slaves, except for the obligation of work, more like their own children than anything else. Breton gives the native name of Dominica as Wade at Bulli. The Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, 1748, in as far as it left the then unsettled island of Dominica to the undisturbed possession of the native Indians was violated by the English only twelve years later, on the pretext that the French had made establishments on the island. From then on until the end of the century these two pillars of civilization ousted one another from their respective nests as often as and whenever opportunity offered, and we can well imagine that between them the native Indian, if not exterminated, was driven more and more into the fastnesses of forest and mountain. Writing in 1795, Atwood, in his History of Dominica, mentions as still prevalent the Carib custom of head deformation, and the skill with which even the children used bow and arrow. Even the memory of both is now lost, though as late as 1862 the Dominican Caribs sent the following articles to the London Exhibition, a nest of twelve baskets, bows and arrows, hebike, manioc sifter, rattles, powder flasks, dishes. Although I know of no records for that time, it is probable that the first half of the 19th century was the period of the Dominica Carib's final conversion to Christianity, and of the greatest decay in national language, tradition, and custom. An old Carib still living told me that previous to the middle of the last century there was no church in or near the reserve, but that some Caribs used to go to Marie Galante in their canoes to attend Mass, or to have their children baptized. In 1877, and again some 15 years later, Salibia, around which the Caribs were already concentrated, was visited by the American ornithologist, Frederick Ober, who appears to have been the first person since the middle of the 18th century to take the slightest interest in this last isolated island tribe. It is noteworthy that he is still remembered in the reserve today by men and women who could have been little more than infants at the time of his visit. 
Ober's Camps in the Caribbees is a travelogue and, as such, unsatisfactory as to ethnological data as much by lack of detail as by the constant suspicion of inexactitude, or rather, poetic license. I have spoken to several sons and daughters of Ober's two guides at the time of his first visit, and none of them claims to remember having heard such a story as that told by Ober of his encounter in the forest. With the Med chief who spoke only Carib. Nevertheless, owing to the Carib's peculiar reticence, as much with one another as with strangers, this does not exclude the possibility of such an encounter having taken place. Likewise, according to present-day Caribs, his story of the army of coast-bound crabs met with in the mountains is either grossly exaggerated or refers to a small species known as the soldat, or hermit crab the Syric crab disliking the sea, and the other, black, or white, land crabs being rarely found on the windward coast, or in the regions mentioned. Ober found a number of older men and women in Salibia who spoke an Indian dialect as their mother tongue, and even noted the persistence, in that late day, of the differentiation between men's and women's languages. He mentions the snake legend, and speaks of finding archaeological remains in St. Vincent, but not in Dominica. I have heard of, though not seen, old stone implements and rocks with writing on the wooded heights between the Akaya River and the Arachuri Ravine. At the time of Ober's visits the so-called reserve was some. What smaller than at present, but there were other Carib lands and settlements at North End, between the Pegwa and Marigot, Wesley, Laswa, Kalibashi, Penville, Morn Caribi, and Delis. In June 1903 the Carib reserve in its present form was created by decree, and its boundaries delimited as extending from the Akeu, or Raymond, River, some say the Arachuri Ravine and there seems to be no existing document to settle the matter, to Queria, or Big River, a dry ravine, along the coast, inland, up the latter ravine to the ridge, and hence down the ravine poem to the Pegwa River, which the boundary then follows up to do branches, whence it cuts across in a straight line to the Akaya River. This decree made no attempt to define the status of the reserve, nor of its inhabitants and their chief. In point of fact, the Caribs merely continued their traditional custom of electing from their numbers a chief or headman, Tibutu, whose duty it is to advise and direct members of the tribe and to settle such disputes as may arise among them. For some years prior to 1930 this institution received a degree of official recognition, with remuneration to the extent of 10 shillings, $2.40, a month in return for which the local government held the chief responsible for order within the reserve generally, and for the upkeep of the coastal bridle path through Carib territory. In September 1930, a few days after the hurricane, and a month after my first visit, the so-called Carib War took place. Five Negro policemen invaded the reserve, seized some tobacco and rum they alleged to be contraband, and made two arrests. Then, a dispute arising, they opened fire on an unarmed crowd of men, women, and children, killing two and injuring others. The Caribs in their turn set upon the police with stick and stone and chased them from the reserve. The upshot of this episode was the discontinuance of the office of chief. The following gleanings, gathered during my often hasty visits to the reserve, half a century after those of Ober, represent fairly well what remains of the Carib language and culture. Descriptive and physical the present Carib Reserve extends along some eight miles of rugged, irregular coastline in the middle of Dominica's windward side. A series of rocky streams flow from the hills and enter the sea by way of deep wooded ravines and small inlets two to three miles apart. After a few hours tropical downpour, they come down, to use a local expression, changing for the time being into roaring and impassable torrents. Between Rounded shoulders or spurs rise 200 or 300 feet above the shore and run back up to a central mountain ridge some 3 miles distant from and 2,000 feet above the Atlantic. From here, the land falls sharply in woodland and provision grounds to the valley of the Pegwa River, which forms the inland or western boundary of the reserve, Fig. 11, in all, there may be upward of 3,000 acres, but not more than a tenth of this is capable of any sort of cultivation by far the greater part being nothing but rock and tough. A good wide bridle path of red clay, extremely slippery in wet weather, winds in and out near the coast, up and down the steep sides of the intervening spurs. 
The Carib's dwellings, though usually well hidden by trees and shrub, are seldom far away from this road. There are but two settlements, one, Bataka, being 15 minutes climb from Queria, or Big River, the northern boundary, the other, St. Sir, adjoining the road high above the Salibia River. Elsewhere their dwellings are scattered along the hillsides or in the ravines, wherever their owner's fancy or convenience has placed them, some close together, others more than half a mile from their neighbor. Disease, malnutrition, and miscegenation results of the American Indian's unfortunate but very real inadaptability to social and economic conditions other than his own have reduced the tribe to about 400 souls, of whom less than a quarter are entirely free from Negro blood. Physically, the Caribs of Dominica, the product of a cross between the fierce Carib invader and the docile Arawak islander in pre-Columbian days, are a small though sturdy people, the men averaging around 5 feet 3 inches and the women about 5 feet. I have seen a few decided dolichocephals, even among the purer types, though the latter are usually subbrachycephalic, especially the women, with an index of between 79 and 81. They have straight black hair of coarse texture, which acquires in some a reddish tint through exposure to the sun's rays. Their foreheads are high and broad, their cheekbones wide, their chins well-rounded. Mouths and lips are usually small or medium, the noses straight, and sometimes slightly flattened. Their eyes are rather small and deep-set, long and narrow, with the mongoloid or epicanthic fold, though not as a rule oblique, and are fringed with long silky lashes. Their ears are large, long, and often lobeless, their feet small, broad, and extraordinarily high-arched. Wainika Agulakati Iwak slash salve slash Awagama Quinara Oerer figure 11 map of Carib Reserve. The girls are round-faced, plump, broad-shouldered, and remarkably straight in the loins. Men and women alike have little or no body hair. Their hue varies, apart from reasons of blood admixture, but is always distinct from any Eurafrican blend being of a light coppery or fulumort tinge, sometimes likened to dried cinnamon. Like so many others of his race, the Dominica Indian is reticent by nature, sensitive, and quick to take offense, and given to occasional moods of melancholy and unreasonableness. Indifference, one of his best-known traits, coupled with innate shyness, the Patois term kukia expresses what I mean here much better than are. Shy originally it was the name for a kind of crab which, when it cannot escape unobserved, will curl up and remain perfectly still, so that by no amount of scrutiny or poking can it be made to show the least sign of life, undoubtedly has been one of the principal causes. For the bolder, more hot-blooded Negroes relatively greater success as a lover, and for the increasing proportion of mixed blood in the reserve today. It has, moreover, contributed to the decay and disappearance of language, legend, and custom, and renders doubly difficult today the task of eking out such vestiges of these as still remain. The war feuds of other days have been replaced by a multitude of petty jealousies and hatreds, but the Caribs still resort to sorcery and PA as instruments of injury and revenge. Though, or perhaps just because, the Butu, war club, of yore has gone forever, that other no less formidable weapon, the tongues of the women folk, rages more mercilessly than before. In vain one looks among his present-day descendants for that fierceness which is said to have characterized the Carib of old, earning for him a symbolic association with the Malfini, or Mansphenix hawk. Much has been made of the Indian's custom of walking in single or Indian file, and this is as true today in Dominica as ever or elsewhere, but it seems to be the natural outcome of a habit acquired of necessity on forest trails rather than a racial tradition. More significant, perhaps, is the Indian's peculiarly emphatic, stumpy, forward-falling gait, which, in a manner, is reproduced in his speech, character, and way of life. The Caribs' love of travel, in an island where nine-tenths of the population never move without good reason outside a radius of half a mile from their homes, is perhaps worth mention. Few are the men of the reserve who have not at one time or another visited one or all of the neighboring islands of Guadeloupe, Marie Galante, Martinique, and that with the prospect of no more than a wine or rum debauch if lucky, and a term of imprisonment if caught. Others have left the country for Guyana, Bolivia, or Cuba, as opportunity offered, in search of adventure rather than fortune. Men, women, even children, 
think nothing of a 35-mile tramp, over mountain track and through virgin forest, to Roseau, the capital, for the sole purpose of selling a few baskets or of buying a few yards of sailcloth or a pound of nails. Their business concluded and their money spent, they will take the homeward road immediately and, if only there be a moon to guide them, march all night through to arrive home by daybreak. Whether cause or effect of poverty, I do not know, but the Indian's proverbial ignorance of the value of money remains as much a fact as his general indifference. In Dominica, at least, he has no other scale of worth than his present want I do not say need, advisedly, I have seen a girl starve her baby in order to procure it a baptismal robe it would use only once. When he has made up his mind to buy or sell, the worst bargain in the world will not deter the carib, nor persuade him to await a better opportunity. On the other hand, he will let you vainly wait months for a basket or some other article you have ordered from him, and appear dissatisfied, if and when he finally condescends to bring it, with the price originally set by himself. For a number of reasons Jay have not been able to push my inquiries into Carib life and lore and especially with regard to the archaeological material, which I believe to be plentiful as far as I should have wished. Perhaps the same petty jealousies of which I have spoken prevented some members of the tribe from communicating to me or at least prompted them to demand exorbitant sums for their only possibly valuable information all that they knew of their nation's language and legend. Less excusable is the crass ignorance of many creoles, white and colored alike, in a position to know better, as to the nature and aims of ethnological research. The ridicule and suspicions of such individuals in a pseudo-civilized community inevitably render the student's task all the harder. On the other hand, I am profoundly grateful to those others with whom I have come in contact, of whatever color or race, for their sincere collaboration and loyal friendship, social and sexual. Social organization, in as far as it can be said to exist at all, is extremely slack among the Caribs today, and appears to have been so always. Previously there were two chiefs in Dominica, one for the windward side, another for the leeward side of the island, but their authority was never more than of an advisory or paternal nature, even where it was combined with that of magnetizer or sorcerer. Even the punishment of crimes committed within the tribe was left to the individuals or family concerned. The chiefs, though often of the same family, seem to have been chosen by common consent for some recognized superiority or sagacity, ordeals of pain or hunger endurance were common, rather than by hereditary privilege. In wartime, on the contrary, supreme authority was given to another commander, or war chief, who usually led the combined armies of Dominica and Guadeloupe. Today, in spite of certain local prejudices and jealousies, the only social unit which can be said to subsist is the family. No puberty ceremonies have survived. Nevertheless, girls and women maintain a certain seclusion at their menstrual periods, especially the first, and do not leave the house, even to bathe in the river or for their personal necessities. Were they to do so, it is said that the fresh odor of their blood would cause the dog spirits to follow and attack them and any other person who might take the same track. Actual contact with such blood would bring about local swelling, while any man so foolish as to have connection with a menstruating woman would inevitably suffer from severe backache and general debility for some time after. In Creole Patois, a woman's menstrual period is known as her moon, and the Indians, formerly at any rate, held the moon to be responsible for this sickness. Chastity is not considered of importance in the unmarried, whether man or woman as is evinced by the prevalence and good treatment of outside children in married households. Without demur, a husband will often support, together with his own legitimate offspring, three or four of his wife's children from various prenuptial lovers, his own illegitimate progeny, if any, remain with their mother. Conjugal infidelity, while regarded in a more serious light, seldom, if ever, leads to a permanent separation or estrangement. Love, as we understand it, is not recognized, although instances of it no doubt exist. Carib girls usually are taken, soon after if not before they reach puberty, by surprise attack, although not by force. By that I mean, and I understand the word Uderika to mean, that a young man will watch for an opportunity and ambush a girl when she goes to the river or into the woods alone. If discovered, 
he will chase, catch, and hold her by force, although he will not resort to rape if she still resists him. The curious thing about this is that in no case will the girl shout or call for help or otherwise betray her presence to anyone passing near, when once she is caught, while. On the other hand, even should she submit, she probably will go straight home and tell her mother, knowing full well that in all likelihood she will receive a beating in consequence. This attitude may be explained, perhaps, by the Carib girl's profound sense of shame, see word Kagya, combined with deep-rooted inherent passivity. The aims of marriage are practical, the main reason being the desire to found a family as an independent economic unit. No established custom with regard to marriageable parties is recognized today, but marriages between crossed cousins, a girl with her paternal aunt's son, a boy with his maternal uncle's daughter, are still common. Although no prenuptial tasks are demanded of the Carib youth today, certain restrictions are sometimes placed on him during his period of courtship, which, for example, may be limited to a monthly or bi-monthly visit. Weddings, as also baptisms, are celebrated according to the rites of the Catholic Church, and are followed by a dance and drinking bout in the home of the bride's parents where the couple henceforth take up their residence until such time as they are able to build and establish a home of their own. It is not usual for husband and wife to spend the whole night together each retires to sleep on a separate couch or mat. Rockefeller mentions the fact that the island carib of his day never touched a pregnant woman. This is still true, be the woman his own wife or another. I have heard a married woman protest that she was not normally pregnant, but that a PA had put a tetchy in dog-headed Dominica constrictor, in her belly. On the other hand, legend reports this snake as having had connections with women in the old days. Parturition is accomplished in a squatting or sitting posture, in the old days by straddling a hammock split lengthwise down the middle, and with the assistance of some old sage femme, whose manipulations and remedies are of very doubtful benefit to the patient. After giving birth, the Carib woman remains confined to the house for 40 days, i.e., until her retour to couches. Suckling by the mother is general, and often of long duration. I came across a little boy of about four years, who, after helping his elder sister to carry up water from the river, used to claim and obtain refreshment from his mother's tototes, breasts, children's speech, possibly from Carib Totaka, to support. In the all too frequent event of a woman dying in childbirth, the maternal aunt or even the grandmother will suckle the infant. I was told that any woman who once has born, irrespective of age, may induce lactation by the use of certain herbs, some applied locally, others taken internally. I was unable to learn their names, with two exceptions, the ripe fruit of the corossal, a nona muricata, and a berry they call curabtim, renial maya exaltata. Whatever the cause, I myself witnessed the case of a woman whose youngest child was a grown man, giving the breast with apparent success to her niece's newborn baby. Clever as the Carib woman would seem to be in inducing the rise of her milk, so her attempts to get rid of it appear clumsy to us. When the time for weaning has come, her usual procedure is to milk herself onto a fire stone, or, better still, into the nest hole of a species of large black ant, known locally as Formis mordants. The naming of infants has, nowadays, become confused with Christian baptism, though the baptismal name itself is rarely, if ever, used in afterlife, its place being taken by another, chosen concurrently. Despite the priest's protests, baptism is delayed until at least one month after birth that is, until the septa of the cranium have joined. The choice of names falls to the godparents to the godfather in the case of a boy, to the godmother in the case of a girl. Carib names, such as Waconic, Marica, Simonari, are known to have been used as recently as 20 years ago, but no living example remains. The non-baptismal name now takes their place. Most families bear surnames, or, as they call them, titles relics, in all 35729389. Probability, of their forefather's conversion and of the name of his white godfather. Such today are Davil, Lucienne, Vivoli, John, Daru, Benjamin, etc. But already these names are falling into disuse and being forgotten even by their bearers, who designate the individual by attaching the patronymic to the name so, Norbert John, the son of John Jules, 
the son of Jules Benjamin. Friends sometimes swap or exchange names. The Carib of Dominica retains the Indian's traditional dislike of the indiscriminate use of his name. In ordinary forms of address he almost always uses compere, camera, the old gossip, cousin, chef, babe, boy, etc. He habitually refers to people by a nickname, poppet, fan fan, or by abbreviating the real name, Maham for Madame Hamilton. When traveling or staying in some other part of the island or abroad, he invariably changes his name adopting for the time what Roth calls a nom de voyage. The reason for this, as explained to me by a Carib friend, is that nobody can do you anything, P.A., charm, when they do not know your right name. This idea that the name is part and parcel of the thing or person to whom it belongs, and the adoption of a false denomer, in order to trick the nefarious genii, is, I believe, peculiarly Indian. Thus, before going to the provision grounds or to the woods for food, a mother of the old school will tell her children that she is going to foyer for miss, dig for ants, fearing that she would be unlucky and return empty-handed should she pronounce the real name, and say, for example, that she was going to look for Wawa. Wild Yam, Rajana Cordata L. Forms of greeting are seldom used by the Caribs. Even after a long absence, a man will arrive with a simple I am come, and take leave before a long separation, with no more than an I am going. Women and children eat in the kitchen apart from the men and after the latter have finished. I understand that this habit is peculiar, in Dominica, to the Caribs, though it would seem to be more a matter of convenience than custom in a community where the women do all their own housework. Vestiges of taboo seem to subsist with regard to the eating of certain foods. One old woman gave as the reason for not eating a species of sea crab, called Agaya, that the latter sometimes had to do with women. She averred that this crab, were it to meet a girl or woman on the beach, would crawl up and urinate on her leg, thus rendering her pregnant for him. We read that the Caribs of other days would not eat hen, turtle, or eel for fear of thereby acquiring the unworthy characteristics of these beasts. There are Caribs in Dominica today who, for similar reasons, will not touch the meat of shark, conger eel, or an elsewhere widely consumed variety of fish, locally known as vive. On the other hand, Caribs consider the white man's custom of manuring land as disgusting, and would never knowingly eat food so grown. The finding of dung in a provision ground is sufficient reason for abandoning a part or the whole of the cultivation. A serious dispute arose, while I was in the reserve because one family accused members of another family of leaving excrement on their land. Perhaps this is one more reason why the Caribs' gardens are so far from their dwellings. There does not seem to be any hard and fast rule with regard to the division of labor between the sexes, except such as physical fitness dictates. Hunting, fishing, sawing, land clearing, canoe and house building are obviously men's occupations, here as elsewhere. Work on the provision ground is fairly evenly shared. Twine and cords, torches, shark oil, carib panniers, manioc sifters, and culovers are made by men usually, though not exclusively. Vegetable oil, palma christi, known here as carapat, open, radial kitchen and garden baskets, corbels, the cleaning and, until recently, spinning of cotton, the preparation of farim and cassava bread except for the grating of the manioc at which the men often help in all other household duties are women's work. Although a Carib be returning straight to his house after a fishing expedition, he expects his women folk to meet him on the shore and to carry the fish home. When compelled to carry a load himself, the Carib man always puts it on his shoulder or back, whereas the women have adopted the Creole Negro custom of bearing burdens on the head. River bathing is a daily habit with all Caribs, but once a month the Carib man takes a special kind of bath in the privacy of his own home with water in which certain herbs have soaked. The names of three so used are, the sensitive plant, Dimasa pudica, Sumark, Cassia bicapsularis, and Kudjuruk or Kugaruk unidentified. The bath must be taken on the night when the moon is new or good, that is, for planting, and its object is that of a spiritual antiseptic said to counteract and defeat the evil effects of possible sorcery or P.A. directed against the bather during the preceding moon. A few simple remedies used by the Caribs of Dominica today are, 
in the case of local inflammation, half of an ember baked green papaya applied hot as a poultice. Internal contusion, the gum of the lowland red gamir, Bacera gumifera, as a plaster. Wounds and cuts, the pounded heart of the kanu tree, together with salt. Shark oil and pimento leaves are also used, as is the fat of the tetchien boa. Flux, or intestinal chill, an infusion of the bark or roots of the wild white guava. Colic, an infusion of the seeds or leaves of the bay tree, carib, ashuru, pimenta acris. Debulite in women, a concoction made from the tuber called carib, or red, chalata, cipura sp. Lack of appetite, water in which has soaked simaruba chips, wild quasha, simaruba amara. These are straightforward household symbols. Others partake more of the nature of charms. Of the latter, the best known are, Surret de Montaigne, a sweet-smelling vine found only in the depths of the high woods, and El Anvers Caribe, Maranta Indica sp., a rare species of small-leaved native arrowroot, not the ordinary white or red Maranta, with reddish leaf stems and tubers that go straight down and are said to intertwine or plate themselves. Native tobacco and a stupefying variety of ivy, or copy, are known, but are not, as far as I could learn, now used. Earth or clay is eaten by some, but the practice is regarded as a vice by the community. On the other hand, many vouch for the good effects of one's own or another's urine, drunk warm, as a cure for poisoning or stomach ache, an emetic, while others chew the gum of the gamir, Dacardiodes hexandra and Isica heptophila, in order to improve their wind. An aphrodisiac, known as pudra pine torchu, powdered turtles. Penis, is made and sold in the island. A carib does not dream for nothing, I was told. He believes his dreams announce or portend grave events affecting himself, his family, or his friends. It certainly is amazing how often such omens prove correct. All serious sickness and death itself are looked upon, not as the result of disease or age but as the works of extra-natural agencies known as PA. Thus, little confidence is placed in ordinary medical means of restoring health. The Caribs do not fear death, but are terrified at the idea of the hospital, and especially of being separated from their home environment in their last moments. A PA, to become effective, must be instituted by three persons usually two men and a woman. The actual harm in any PA is wrought by spirits who have, so to speak, no personal grievance, but, bullet-like, are merely unleashed and set onto a given person when he or she unwittingly touches some object such as a stick or branch placed across the path harmless in itself, but magically dealt with by the PA men in order to make it the agency for releasing the PA. So one may, by good luck or cunning, escape a PA intended for oneself, or fall, by yule chance, under a PA intended for somebody else. They are taking life tonight, said an old Carib friend of mine the night he died of what I took to be a pleurisy brought on by the enforced wearing of wet clothes. I have often wondered whether he referred to the persons he believed to have bewitched him or to the death spirits themselves. Three years later, two weeks ago as I write now. His widow assured me that it was useless for me to try to save their ten-year-old daughter, as the child had fallen under the same spell as the father, and had been sick ever since the latter's death. The girl was well grown, but very thin, and had swellings on neck and shoulders. She said her whole body hurt her. At the time I last saw her alive she kept vomiting a light colorless froth, and had a very quick pulse and normal temperature. At her own request I procured eggs and milk for her, and sent for the doctor on my own responsibility. But the message was either distorted or misunderstood, for the doctor neither sent any word nor put in an appearance, and when, five days later, the girl died, she was buried without a certificate, as is customary. In the reserve. If, as is probable, it was a case of tubercular meningitis, an immediate operation might have saved the child's life. Death is announced as soon as it takes place by a single protracted blast of the concave shell, corn lambi. Law and hygiene demand that burial take place within 24 hours though Labat records having seen the body of a carib dead several months and perfectly preserved through the use of Rauku, Bira or Elana, but this is preceded, whenever possible, by a wake to which all and sundry come to make pigs of themselves on the rum provided. 
When the last grog is drunk and the coffin made on the spot by some of the men present nailed down, a procession is formed to conduct the corpse to the little cemetery of Saint Marie, the last home of the last Antillians. The reading of a French prayer by some old woman more literate than the rest, the tolling of a cracked bell, and the coffin is bestowed in a hastily dug grave almost within reach of the Atlantic waves. Burial in the fetal posture under the floor of the carb was suppressed by the priests some seventy years ago. The depth of the grave as dug today is supposed to be equal to the length of the body. Kite days after the burial a sort of second wake is held in the house where the deceased died. In the event of this not having been his or her usual abode, two wakes, or priors, as they are called, are held. The deathbed is decorated with white flowers, candles, and objects having belonged to the dead man or woman. Until midnight women and girls sit around a table and sing French cantucks, while men and boys wander about, chatting and drinking. Fires are then lighted outside the house and cocoa and cassava bread prepared and offered to those present. At this time the girls usually pair off with the boys and disappear into the bushes, while the older men and women sit round the fire drinking rum and telling tales and conundrums. Sometimes a sort of ronde, or rajon, is danced around the fire before the dispersal at daybreak. The meaning and object of this ceremony seems to be a kind of spiritual fumigation to rid the house of the now nefarious spirit of the new dead, which continues to lurk thereafter. Burial, as perhaps also of the evil powers that caused the death. The belief in the uncanny quality of the newly dead as well as of the newborn and yet unnamed child is very widespread. Whatever its origin, the local priests condemn this ceremony and several have assured me that there is nothing in the Christian religion to justify it. Until recent years a type of wrestling was much practiced by the Dominica Caribs whenever they were drunk or quarrelsome. I have never witnessed it personally, but from the accounts of all those who have, it seems to have been more in the nature of a sporting contest than of an aggressive attack. Childhood, Games and Pastimes Fred Ober wrote of the Carib children of Dominica in 1877 that they should be the happiest on earth because of their freedom to play and wander naked among rocks and river pools. Perhaps. But children the world over are usually happy as long as they are well, and rarely appreciate relative advantages or disadvantages. The street urchin of our own lands takes the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune as much for granted as does the pampered darling of wealthy parents his movies, candy, and other luxuries. One may still find carib youngsters clothed as nature made them running around and about their homes. This does not mean that they never wear clothes, but merely that dressing is to them what dressing up is to our children. The school has come to Salibia since Ober's time and although few of the present generation of young Caribs have learned anything of value to them there, they have come to regard the everyday use of clothes and shoes together with the talking of broken English as marks of a special superiority. Can we blame them? The Negro policemen who have established themselves in the reserve despite Carib protest, the Negro storekeeper in Marigot where they run errands for their parents, their own Negro schoolmaster they all do these things and who shall deny that such august personages are their Carib elders' superiors in authority, wealth, and knowledge of the world? Undemonstrative as they are, the Caribs show a great deal of affection for their children, and an almost equal reluctance to discipline or punish them. In consequence, the children do pretty much as they please, and neither eat, sleep, nor bathe at regular hours, but get their whack of coffee, rum, or whatever else is going. Like other young people brought up in the tropics, they seem apathetic when compared with those of northern climes, and will often sit quiet and idle in a corner for hours rather than bestir themselves to go out and play. Even their games are usually of a sedentary order. In pickup, a game common to several parts of the world, the players squat opposite one another and try to pick up from a heap before them a given number of nutshells in time to catch another they have just thrown in the air. Storytelling and the asking of conundrums are among their favorite pastimes as indeed they are those of their elders when these have leisure, as at a wake or during a priora. Some of the stories are hashed up versions of our own fairy lore and legend, while others have a more local flavor. Here is one of the latter, a little girl wanted to visit her nay 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 nay, Marain, godmother, who lived on the other side of a deep, wide river. When she reached its banks, she met a woman whom she asked to carry her across. 
the woman who was no other than Ma Mandi O herself, Water Mama, protectress of all fish, said she would do so willingly were tea not for fear of being betrayed. The little girl promised secrecy and was born to the other side. When she arrived at her godmother's house everybody wanted to know who had helped her to cross the river. At first she refused to tell, but on being pressed, finally gave the secret away. Just before she set out for home her godmother gave her three seeds, one of gumbo, or okra, one of poise, pea, perhaps the poise du shade tree, ingalorina, and one of lavandra, renial mia carabaca, not our lavender, telling her to drop one. Each time she heard the fufu, sp hummingbird, smaller than that known as colibri, sing. The girl had gone a little way, Fufu came flying over her head and sang, Kasalinan bye bye, Kasalinan bye, oh bye, ki trahit ma man do. Oh bye, ki trahit ma man do. NB in Carib, Kasa means porpoise, BB is the word of address for mother. Thereupon the girl dropped the lavandra seed, which immediately grew into a big bush whose blossom Fufu stopped to suck. Later, when the bird had caught up with her and repeated its song, she dropped the gumbo seed, and the same thing happened again. By the time she got to the river she had dropped all three seeds, but the hummingbird was still far behind, busy with the flowers of the poise tree. Ma Mandi. Oh asked if she had been betrayed. The little girl said no, and was carried across as before. She had reached the other bank safely, and was well on her way home, when Fufu arrived at the river, singing his song and alighted on Mamandio's outstretched hand. Mamandio was so enraged with her spy for such the hummingbird was for his delay, that she seized and tore him in four pieces. Here, perhaps, is the explanation of a phrase I have heard used by one or two children, when they did not wish to go unaccompanied on. Some errand, Fufu Kfai Moin Per the Fufu will lead me astray. Again, a young man, Ellie, falls in love with a beautiful girl, Lidha, who unfortunately is Mumu, that is, deaf and dumb. Nevertheless he marries her. One day he goes to the woods to hunt. He kills many birds, but instead of bringing them home, he covers his body with their rotting carcasses. Malfini, the Mansphoenix or West Indian hawk, flies to Lidha's hut and sings, Lidha, Lidha, Eli Morut and Bois, La Sivioka. Lidha perceives that something is wrong and follows Malfini, who leads her to the woods and repeats his song. On reaching the place where Ellie is lying, Malfini repeats the song a third time, and Lidha recovers her hearing and speech. Or, a newly married man notices that his wife habitually gets up and leaves the hut as soon as she supposes him to be asleep. He follows her secretly to the river, where, after singing the following incantation, Yantabu, my dear, my dear, Yantabu, Maya Sazing Poli and Pang Sensi A Malhi Ruiz, Sabab, Sabab, she turns into a Krabir, SP. Egret, and flies away. The next day he challenges his wife to a singing contest, and, when she declares she knows no more, repeats the above lines himself, whereupon the woman turns back into a Krabir, flies onto the roof, and is shot by the husband. NB Yan in the first line and Lian in the third line would seem to be parts of the Carib verb, NIE etc., I do, or say. Tibu is the pronominal suffix for thee. Another story, of which I have never been able to get a complete version, tells of a man who used to go to the house of a zombie, spirit, and sing, Tuk Tika Tuk, Ang Kao Bab, Mo Kot Koa, Mo Koi Kaua, Li Tang Tang in order to make the spirits come out and dance. It appears he came to a bad end, poor fellow. Whether the words have a meaning or not I cannot say. Some say mo kekare instead of mo kao kao dot. The conundrums, common to most of the islands, are innumerable, and of the following order, what is it that, has no roots when it has leaves, and no leaves when it has. Roots, answer, a sailing vessel. A child that beats its mother, answer, a pestle. Water standing upright, answer, Sugarcane. Before asking a conundrum one must challenge with the words Tim Tim, whereupon the challenged answers Bras Chess, Bras Sec, Dot. Similarly, before starting out to tell a tale, it is usual to preface the words Crick Crack. In the water game called Mamandio, after the fish mama a personage, 
by the way, whose reputed presence in certain pools at certain seasons still commands the very real respect of the grown UPS the child who is it asks the others in turn whether they eat flesh or fish. Those who say flesh may go free, while the more daring spirits who reply fish must be caught, ducked, and devoured. Tops and stilts are known and made on the reserve from local materials. The black wax of the native wild stingless bee, meal sir, is used by children and others for modeling grotesque human and animal figures. Out of six leftover strands of larumen, many children make a kind of finger stall, which contracts and holds fast the finger unwarily in. 125 served, figure 12. It is known as an underscore at trap or wife leader they also make two toy figures from strands of split coconut palm. One, accordion-like and sometimes several feet long, they call a music, fig. 13, Roth found these among the Guyana Indian children, who call it a rattle, the other, known as soufflet, or whistle, strangely resembles in miniature the large trumpets of spirally rolled manjagua bark from the Rio Uopes, described by Roth. Perhaps one reason why the Carib child does not waste energy in play is that he or she is expected at an early age to exert himself or herself to help the parents with their tasks, carrying up water from the river, running errands, and so on. Later they work in the provision grounds, catch crayfish, and cut or carry warumon from the woods for basket making and all this in conjunction with supposedly daily attendance at school. I have seen girls of 12 sent off with a nine-hand bunch of bananas, 70 pounds or more, on their heads, carry it without any rest over 10 miles of rough hilly road, and return some hours later with a heavy basket load of Pro VFIGURE 12 at Traplamain or Wife Leader. Zions. Nor is this to be regarded as the result of Figure 13 Music Unkindness, the parents impose much harder tasks upon themselves, and are ignorant of the requirements of immaturity. What wonder, then, if such premature labor, often coupled with an insufficiency of sleep and nourishment, result in a small-statured race who mature late, the average age for puberty in girls is 15, and grow old early. The Carib children of Dominica undoubtedly owe such health and strength as they possess to a sound stock. To their daily baths in the river pools, and to the sun's rays that constantly embrace their little bodies, but I very much doubt whether their lot, today at any rate, is as enviable as Ober supposed it to be. Shelters, huts, ANP Hughes temporary shelters, known generally as ajupas or, among the Carib, as carb, are often built in the woods or elsewhere where there is work to be done. Two, three, or more young saplings are cut and their ends stuck in the ground, or simply bent over to form what may be called the rafters. These are joined at their free ends by one or more tie beams and attached to two uprights sunk in the ground. The whole is covered with the leaves of the ales mush, Carlodovica plumier, or, where available, of Yanga. Until recent times the usual but now rare dwelling of the Dominica Caribs is known as the Muinan, French spelling, the cowboya of the figure 14 scaffolding for carb before covering. Figure 15 Muinan before thatching. Rao Kuyen Indians. This is a simple structure consisting of a ridge pole supported by a main post at either end. Figure 14. The rafters, crossed by rods, gallets, to which the thatch is tied, reach to the ground. The whole is covered with cane straw, vetiviria, or, more rarely, with the leaf of the Yatagu palm. Siagrus sp. The lianas, called mibi and calaboli, are used to tie the thatch to the thatching rods, which are made of wood or bamboo. An interesting thing about these muinans, fig. 15 of which several are still in use as dwellings, is that they ex were commonly built double, one within the other, after the style of a carib pannier in order better to withstand storms. Most kitchens in the reserve, in the West Indies the kitchen is always in an outhouse, even in the homes of the whites, though curiously enough few dwellings, take the form of an improved muinan, raised on posts and runner beams several feet from the ground, the sides boarded in, and the roof covered with coconut. Or Yatagu Palm Thatch, Figure 16. This type of house appears to correspond to the Taboi of Cayenne. The most common type of dwelling house today though only in the last 15 to 20 years has it become so is the regularly built hut, raised some 2 to 4 feet from the ground on piles, with flooring and 
Figure 16 Structure for Kitchen 1. The palm called Yataga or Yadaha has a leaf similar to the glue glue, no spines, and corresponds to dus, Syagrus in every respect except that the nuts are only half the size he mentions. Walls of hardwood boards and roof of shingles, preferably from Caconir, Armosia dasikarpa, or Bois Lezard, Vitex de Varicata. This type of hut is found, with variations, all through the islands, and does not appear to be of native origin. The wood is usually cut and hewn into shape by the future owner, the foundations dug with the help of friends, the house raised, or mounted, with the assistance of a professional carpenter, who may take 25 or 30 shillings for his work, and the roof covered in one day at an almost ceremonious gathering of by no means abstemious helpers and friends. The following are among the commoner woods employed by the Caribs in house building, stakes and piles mangle rouge, rise offerum mangle l, and mangle blanc, a cookoy, bucida bucera l. Borps bois bander, cayenne glabra, bois riviere, chimeris simasa, bois sept ans, meliasma sp, noir, xanthorilum tragodes. Post spalata, mimusops sp, carapite, black heart, possibly aminoa carabia not to be confused with carapate. Rarders angelin, andira inermis, caconir, armosia dasikarpa. Lattice bois riviere, chimeris simasa. Brams bois lezard, vitex de varicata, laurier caca, guetarda parvifolia, laurier rose, a sweet-smelling wood of reddish hue, large tree. Not the so-called rose laurel of other islands. Basketry together with the building of dugout canoes, Basketry now constitutes the Caribs' main industry and source of revenue. Apart from those destined for sale, they make other articles for domestic use of a superior quality, and which seldom are seen outside the reserve. The materials used today, and the manner of their preparation, are as follows, 1, Larumen or, more correctly, Luarum, Jashnasafana Ruma, the Idirite of the Guyana Indians. A slender, palm-like reed with long spatulate leaves, attaining from 12 to 15 feet in height. Cut and tied in bundles of 70 to 100 stems and brought down to the coast, where it is spread out on the beach to dry in the sun for several days. Without this process, during which it acquires an agreeable red russet color, the stems would soon become brittle and unworkable. Some of them are subsequently steeped for a couple more days in middles by the river bank, where they take on a fine shiny black. The blackened stems are, however, less strong than those not so treated. Before use, each stem is split in four or six strands which are then drawn between a knife blade and the finger until the pith is removed and they have been made fine enough for the work in view. If white strands are wanted, as for the linings of carob panniers, they may be obtained by scraping the outer surface of red strands, or merely by laying these inner side uppermost. 2. Roseau, Gynrium saccharoides, a sugarcane-like reed found near water. The midrib of the leaf is peeled, bleached by laying it in the dew, and dried in the sun. While inferior to Larumen in strength, it is of a purer white, and is therefore used in small decorative baskets and for plating hats. Its cane, employed for edging carob panniers, is merely peeled and scraped. 3. Racines Pomist, the aerial, reddish-colored roots of the mountain Pomist, Euterpe Montana, Arica Regia. Used especially for making shoulder carryalls. Cut, peeled, and scraped, then split into two or three strands according to their size and to the worker's requirements. 4. Mibi, Stigmatophyllum puberum, Lianopom, Mircoja sp, Liana grice, Caliboli, and Cord caco are the local names of varying and differently used lianas. The first requires only to be scraped, after which it may be dyed yellow or mauve in the first instance by steeping it in the expressed juice of a small bush carrot like fruit locally called saffron, in the second case, by soaking it in an infusion of the leaves of a small or medium-sized tree known as tan. Not Bursanema spicata, which is also known as tan dot. Lianopome, the water lemon of the English creoles, is only peeled before use, while the others require no preparation. 5. Laudanir, 3 nax sp. The septa of the mature leaves are split in two and worked before becoming too dry. 6. Bamboo. Dried indoors and split into fine strands. 7. Balizir, Heliconia Bihai and H. Carabia. 
The midrib is sun-dried and parallel lengths tied with twine to form simple roll-up mats. 8. Aqua, Pandanus sp. As, 5. 9. Vetiver, Vetiveria odorata. The leaf is bleached by boiling, dried in the sun, and split in two for plating into hats, it. 1. Carib panniers, Pagara, are made in wicker, armadillo, pattern, multiple weft, and in duplicate. The inner lining, or mama, is all white, while the outer covering, or skin, is usually worked in two or more colors, figure 17. Between these two component parts a layer of sun-dried kakibu, maranta kakibu, or bali's ear leaves is arranged carefully to render the basket watertight. The orthodox style consists of a receptacle and a cover, both in duplicate, the latter having two-thirds the depth and a foundation of four strands more than the former, over which it fits tightly. Made in all sizes and shapes, the commonest average, without the cover, is about 30 by 24 inches by 18 inches deep. Some are as large as an old-fashioned trunk, while others, of miniature dimensions, are made in niches of 9 or 12 baskets that fit into one another after the manner of a Chinese puzzle. A game basket-like variety of identical construction, but whose width is about one-third its height and a quarter its length, so as to admit being slung by a cord from the shoulder, is known as portamanto. Valise is the name given to a still more flattened type, fig. 18. There are only two or three caribs left in Dominica who claim to know how to make baskets of the so-called trest variety, and those examples of the latter I so far have seen must be classed as a freak WN as RWSWSY figure E17 carib pannier and cover. Rather than orthodox pattern. Probably as the market for the better work grew worse the average price for the ordinary armadillo pagara has fallen in 10 years from a dollar to a shilm the older men ceased to interest themselves in these ornamental wefts and the young men never learned them. Figure 18 Valise Other utensils manufactured from larumen strands are, a, the pannier coca isle, used for storing eggs, etc., in shape somewhat resembling an open work basket with hexagonal base, fig. 19. Made in open hexagonal weave with horizontal cross weave. About 1 foot to 18 inches across. b. The hebike, or cassava sifter, made in the alternate oniovaran under 2 pattern, either round or, less commonly, rectangular, fig. 20. The projecting strands are bound onto a double hoop edging made from two superimposed lengths of a stout liana known locally as cord caco, heteropterus platyptera. The rectangular variety are of closer weave and somewhat resemble trays. C. Cassava squeezer, figure 21, matapi or caluver, so called, has gone out of general use and become extremely rare in the last 20 years through neglect or inability on the part of the younger generation in their manufacture. The domestic article measures 4% to 5 feet in length and about 4 inches across the mouth when not in use. Its making entails the use of a great deal of larumen, of time, and of care. The local method seems to have been that described by Roth with regard to the Guyana productions, except that here the final strands seem to have been bound around a liana or bamboo ring sometimes instead of being woven into the more usual stirrup-like contrivance for taking the lever. I have endeavored to reintroduce their manufacture and general use, especially with regard to the smaller models which might form an article of sale to tourists. D. Matu, or Carib Tables. These have quite disappeared to FIGURE 19 Pontier Coca Isle Jesus equals, on Lesop equals EFIOMAIU is less tan on L E R O E H R bot on says Estes and R R A E S and says Steer Gan C Estes S A E C T T Serpestes E U S equals N Day, though some old men ream E E E males. Member having seen them in genes 5 he slesisa in their youth. From such describe i triple e ileations as the latter could give me, g e e l e s a t h cell, terra they would seem to have resemnerd ribera e e c c e o fly blood the rectangular habiquets, li fairy li earlier sent hay. With short sticks, about 18 inches sealer, dear c a e e g plus equals a a e in height, set into the four ser ear he e y corners. From all verbal ACC accounts they were made of Laruhai man, and not, as some authors state, from Laudanir, 3 Nas sp. E. Finger traps, or wife leaders, 
as they are sometimes called, are also made of larumen, but have been described already in the section entitled Childhood, Games and Pastimes. 2. Roseau is often used, mixed with larumen, in carib panniers destined for sale. It is of a purer white than the latter and more easily worked. The cane itself invariably forms the bordering or edging of the panniers. In recent years hats have been woven by the women from this material. Fans resembling those of the Guyana Indians are woven in Dominica today, though curiously, not by the Caribs themselves, from a mixture of roseau and larumen strands, fig. 22, 3, Racine's pomists, the reddish end, in the big tree, aerial roots cn. Gone ng 20 year ed, sssses figure 21 cassava squeezer. Of the mountain pomist, Erica sp, Hooderp, Montana provide exceedingly stout strands which might serve a number of purposes, but are used almost exclusively.